Uh, my name is Lisa Jordan McCarthy, and I am the Dean of Education here at Google Village Waller School and one of the founders of the school. So I've been here since before we opened, <laughs> for years before we opened. So um, I'll tell a little bit more about our history, but we're really here to talk about Waller education in general tonight, more than we have to talk about Google Village. And I want to thank our panel ahead of time for taking their the hours out of their evening to be with us and share their perspectives on why they chose Waller Education for, or was chosen for them. <laughs> so um, before I have our panel introduce themselves, I'll just say a little bit about tonight. And um, so I um, discovered Waller Education in 94. And um, my, my story is longer, which is another night in itself, but um, I was really fortunate to discover that before I got married and had a family and raised my own children in the method that I believe in so much. Um, I now have three adult children. Uh, I guess that's how you can't say that. I have three adult <laughs> children anymore. Um, I have three boys, 20, 22, and almost 26. Oh my gosh. Um, and raised at home in the Waldorf Method, and they all three moved to UCLA, two have graduated and gone to their careers, and one is studying abroad right now in Italy, and he better come home or I'll have lots to say about that. Um, and um, tonight we hope to give you a little window into the world of why Waldorf, why would you choose this? There's so many options out there. There's a lot of different public schools, different private schools. What does Waldorf education mean? And so we've been doing this event for many years um, to bring to you voices from students, from parents, from teachers, so that you can see from different perspectives what that might look like and feel like. And then as they introduce themselves and tell a little bit about them and what why they're here, maybe you could start formulating questions that you have, um, doing your own research, and then I could help know who would be the best to answer that. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to let them start introducing themselves, and then we'll start with you, Kathy. <laughs> uh, my name is Kathy Nenden. This is my 25th year of being a Waldorf kindergarten teacher. Before that, I was a play therapist in a pediatric ward and also um, worked in some counseling um, centers, settings with children. I've had a bachelor's and a master's from Cal State Long Beach, Long Beach mm -hmm. um, in child development. So um, this education, my son brought me to this education because I was looking for the right school for him. And he is a little neuroatypical, and so it was really nice to find a school that was okay with him being that way. And then I have a daughter who also went through the world of education, and she was the opposite, where she was very gifted, very quick, very smart. And so she did very well in the world of education and thrived. And when she went to public high school, because there wasn't a high school at the school we were at, she did very well in honors classes and AP classes. And yeah, she's, um, they're both very well-rounded adults. <laughs> and um, so, uh, like I said, I started teaching because I was looking for a place for my child. And I stayed because it finally filled all the gaps for me. Um, being in mainstream child development, it was interesting that it was more mechanical and materialistic. There wasn't a sense that the children have souls. The children have um, these inner feelings. It, it wasn't about just teach them this, teach them this, teach them that. So um, I really, really appreciated it. And I love to tell stories, and that was a big part of the South for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to tell stories and develop jokes and things like that. So. I've been very happily employed for, like I said, almost 25 years. This is my second school. And I like this school quite right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Pleased to have you as a kindergarten teacher. Lots of lucky families getting your first foray. All right, Aaron. Uh, okay, so my name is Aaron Tong. I came here 
I currently am 11th grade at the Wilmer School of Orange County, and I think I came here 2010. I think somewhere around there. So I was one of the early families here, and I've watched the school grow up in a fascinating process. Uh, right as when I graduated eighth grade, this as, this, as you guys know, the school doesn't have a high school, so I went down to WSSC or Wilmer School of Orange County, and that's where I am currently now. Um, yeah. And how was your time here? And how was your transition? Uh, okay, so my time here, it was really good. Uh, it was there was some rough patches, as you can see, but uh, as most can expect. But yeah, it was really good. I enjoyed it, and it was. I'm definitely glad I grew up here and then went to WSU because it was a lot smaller class, and I enjoyed that small, really close setting. And then for my transition, it went. I did transfer in the year when we had COVID, so it was a little bit different. I started my freshman uh, year in my dad's office on the computer instead of in the classroom. But uh, we went back to in person, I think, a month and a half in. So it was really quick. And I don't know, by the second, thirdish month, uh, my classmates were expecting to know things they happened in the first grade. Uh, and I'm like, oh, I wasn't there, but I was instantly integrated into So we'll get back to everyone more questions about what we would like to be a student. What do you learn? Thank you. I'm Amelia Hansley. I currently work here. I'm an aftercare teacher. I'm an aide and I'm a substitute teacher and I just wear many hats. Uh, I'm also an alumna of the Waldorf School of San Diego High School. So I have you know a little bit of experience on both sides as a student and as a teacher. I know a little bit of both. Um, and I actually went to a public elementary school and a Waldorf high school, so I have kind of the opposite experience of a lot of students who do Waldorf elementary school and then public high school. But kind of what Aaron was saying, going into that school, I felt integrated really fast. And I think that Waldorf offers a sense of community that you don't really find in public school. Um, you can make community anywhere you go, but if you're searching for it, Waldorf is a great place to find it. As a student and as an adult, I think, there's just this welcomeness and this openness to who you are, and it, it meets you where you are, and you can grow with it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Tori Carrick. My husband and I are small business owners in Long Beach, and uh, we moved to our current home because it was closely uh, aligned to one of the best elementary schools in Long Beach. And we were there for three years, only to discover that it really wasn't the best school for our family. Uh, again, what, what, what uh, translates to great test scores doesn't always translate to great uh, schools for, for little kiddos and things that they have. So we discovered uh, Waldorf education by way of Sycamore Pre-Community Charter School, which was open during the pandemic. So we explored that for two years in Huntington Beach and transitioned to this school this year. And our transition to this school has been so easy and so beautiful. I'm really thankful that we're here for many reasons. Uh, but I think that, that we uh, represent a unique perspective because we were at one of Long Beach's best elementary schools. Uh, uh, a charter school inspired by Waldorf education, and now this uh, school as well. I, I should say also one of the unique things that I found really uh, interesting about this school is our kiddos went to Little Owl Preschool, which is a Reggie inspired preschool in Long Beach, and many families from that program tend to come here too. <laughs> and so uh, there's a lot of overlap in, in some of the curriculum, and it's been really neat to. Uh, reconnect with many of those families now, many years later. Hi, I'm Henry Lau. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I are in the architecture profession, and uh, we discovered Waldorf five years ago when we were invited out to come to a gathering like this. Uh, I, I should probably credit my wife for all the decisions because she's the one that kind of sends me out into the world to assess uh, because she knows that uh, 
I have this ability to assess with both my logic and my heart. And so that was important to understand like, you know, what would be the right sort of path for our child, uh, our son, Daniel. And as Corey mentioned, you know, we went through Little Al as well, Rachel inspired us. So for us, it was trying to figure out like, what is that transition? And we looked into public school, we looked into you know, other types of schools. And this one felt right. I don't know how else to put it. It just, you know, the sense of community that was also mentioned. Um, I think scale is important. Um, you know, when we looked at sort of the bigger public schools, it felt maybe too systematic, almost like a journey. <laughs> you know, it was sort of just cranking it. And I was like, I'm not sure if that's right. Uh, and so we decided to explore uh, Maple Village and the role of education. And just keeping an open mind all the time, I don't fully understand it. Um, I'll be honest about that sometimes. But as I am engaged more, uh, it actually starts to make a lot of sense. You know, especially when you look, look at it through you know, your own child and how they thrive. Uh, and so I would say in the last five years, it's just, it's been an amazing sort of, you know, to bear witness to, to the growth of, you know, a human being in that, in that sense, so. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Kobina Kome, I'm, or call me Kobe. I'm a uh, podiatrist, foot and ankle surgeon. So my daughters are Maya and Ella, they're in the, Trying to get used to the names. They're in the Joshua Tree class and they're in the Red Bud classes. And they love it here a lot. We've been here six years now, so since the since they were two years old, uh, in the parent toddler classes, uh, same situation as Henry, I think. My wife uh, afterwards somehow trapped me into one of these uh, <laughs> gatherings. Uh, I think it was at the Orange County one and then this one. And I remember sitting there just selfishly thinking, wow. Why didn't my parents uh, enroll me in this school? And I remember thinking that if I could reset, I would, I would go to a Waldorf school. Um, so, for example, they're with Miss Amelia in uh, extended care, and they never want to leave. <laughs> uh, it's 5:30. Um, trying to get them in the car. I'm sure you're tired. They, they don't want to leave campus. So I think that's that's interesting because it's I've seen them grow in their confidence exponentially over the years, and I, I think it's because this environment is nurturing and accepting uh, of who they are as a person. So um, as I've learned more about the education, um, I really love it you know, for our kids, and I, I mean, I'm uh, excited for the future of the human race, just watching these kids, how adjusted they are, just talking to Aaron. Even today, I'm like, wow, was I, I was not that confident as an 11th grader, you know? So. So that's our journey, so if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, thank you. So, I'm um, not sure there could be a wide range of your research into Waldorf education so far. You could be brand new to it and say, like, some of the things like, I don't know, somebody, my partner told me to come, and so here I am. <laughs> or you could be like, oh my gosh, it's been on my radar for a long time, and I've been reading a lot, and I have a lot of questions. Or you could be somebody who's already here and say, I'm seeing this, I'm not understanding what that is. Um, so I, I think first I'm going to allow you to, I'm going to open it up to see what kind of questions you have and if time permits or that's what you want, we can even go deeper into that. What is early childhood look like? If you could address that. What do the grades, what is the whole, you know, what stands out in all their education? What is it all about? What's the secret? <laughs> it's hopefully not a secret anymore. So I'm going to let, I'm going to ask you if you have, if you Come with any questions so far in your research or anything that popped up on the, on the little uh, video for you, which was the 100. Yes, we celebrated our Walder 100th anniversary of Walder education a few years ago, so that was really exciting. It's exciting. So, anything that you have for me? You don't have to. I have a question for parents. Um, so, uh, in the like, uh, kind of what I know of, it's uh, I hear that one of the things really just screens and phones and 
TV and stuff like that. So how is that transition? Like, were you guys watching a lot of stuff for the kids? Great question. I can take that. I, um, we don't, I mean, there are TVs in our home, but it's never on. And I think our kids led us there. They didn't really react well to the, the TV or the screen being taken away from them. So eventually, we, before even coming to World War, before our kid was born, my wife sent me articles about how media can be bad. And I sent her articles back about how media can be great. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. live in. And so she obviously won that battle. Um, but I remember, so we don't really do any screenings. You know, there are, my family's in New York, and so we always communicate. By a video, so they know how to use screens. However, it's not a part of our life. And I haven't told my wife this, but I remember going to the Apple store once with my oldest, Maya. She's eight now, and she'd never really held a cell phone before. Um, and so as I'm waiting, I just give her the phone. I said, Don't tell your mom. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I mean, I'm not kidding. Within five minutes, she was playing like a Dungeons and Dragons game <laughs> and asking me how to jump, double tap, or jump, triple jump, or how to jump, different things. So, I think uh, the way they make phones and media now, it's very, um, you can learn fairly quickly. And I think Waldorf, if you're not media centric, can help you be prepared for literally anything. And that includes media. So I want my kid to be more of a creator as opposed to a consumer. And that's why the, if, you know, if media is not accepted widely here, it doesn't mean you can't integrate it in your life somehow. But definitely minimize it. I think it is helpful. Then to be creative. People ask me, what are you doing at home on the weekends? Because the TV's not on, and it's, well, everything. How I grew up. I grew up in Ghana. Wasn't a lot of TV, and it's just a lot of play and creativity. You'd be surprised what you can do without having that um, as a major part of it. But I understand that it is everywhere. It can be tough, even for parents and older. So, yeah. Do you want to do you want to answer to what other parents? Yeah, I was going to add to it a little bit. I, I think. It was a little bit of an adjustment, um, but I think it also helped our family in general because we unplugged as well. And so it was a conscientious effort to all be on the screen, right? And so what we found is that we discovered other things that actually made us closer or made us a little bit more whole, if that makes sense. Sometimes we get lost in these things, and so it kind of gave us back a little bit of that. And I've got an interesting perspective to add to that because, again, we were at uh, a local school, public school for three years, kindergarten through second grade, and the first cell phone arrived in our first grade classroom, believe it or not. There were two kids in our first grade classroom who had cell phones to call their parents for emergency purposes. So it created a dialogue in first grade about, well, why can't I have a cell phone? And I'll tell you, one of the really neat things about transitioning to a world of education is that's not present. So that, that peer pressure or that societal exposure is not there. So I feel like, in our experience, there's less push for it now as it was when they were younger because it's not really around, if that makes any sense. And I will add a little bit because I think that's something that we have in common is that we don't have a it's just like, let's think about it. Like, before school, if you digest all that, you come in, your brain is not really here to like focus and learn. And how do we digest all that rich, juicy information they're receiving all day to seep into them overnight and come back without being kind of impacted by a lot of flashing messages to interrupt that? But um, so I raised. My husband and I, I'll give him a little bit of credit, um, <laughs> raised the voice with, with Albania. And of course, the oldest always gets the front of it. Oh, firstborn child, you're going to have no sugar and you're not going to do anything. And the next one comes along and you're like, okay, well, a little, your brother's okay, so a little bit. Of <laughs> and the last one, you're like, whatever. Um, but um, so, you know, just a little taste of because I know media is a question that comes up for people. They're like, I don't know, what's that about? But so my oldest, you know, and like you said, um, my husband and I said too, like raising them to be creators and of consumers, and my oldest wound up, you know, making all these marble noises around the house and doing all these things, and then he finally had like an old camcorder, you know, old, um, and started filming and realizing how much he loves film. Well, he, so he wound up 
long story short, he applied to film schools for college, and they're very hard to get into. He applied to UCLA. They accepted only 21 students out of, there was I think, uh, 2,000 applications. And he got in. And his essay was about being a creator instead of a consumer and how he grew up that way in figuring out things and looking at it from the lens of not just sitting and taking it in, but actually creating and being a storyteller. That's what they want in movies. He's often making films. And so it's kind of like this interesting story about this like hold back the media, but now that's going to be his like, and he said, I want to create things to inspire people to make them get up and do something to make the world a better place. You know, so I think um, thinking of it in terms of kind of yeah, and when he grew, when they grew up, they went through the same thing. Like, what can I have one? They're seeing the Hardy Hair Party movies, and I only read the books. And okay, well, the books are better. Um, <laughs> but it's that um, what happened was when we said, well, with your friend, you know, you can if you go to your friend's house, we just kind of want to know what's going on. We can like micromanage it. But what happened is all the friends came to our house because we gave them hammers and nails and wood, and they could build forts in the background, they had a zip line, and they could climb a tree, and they could paint brushes, and they could, they could do stuff they didn't get to do at their house, because they would just be doing video games. So, I'm more worried about myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we could talk about that. So. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's very important is when children do not consume the media, they have now the freedom and the space and in early childhood, they have the simple toys, simple things, and they can use their imagination, which is right always on the surface. But if they do a lot of media, what they're doing in their play is just recapitulation of what they saw. Because they have to, young children have to do it in order to understand it. So, uh, this week, somebody was saying, yeah, we're going to play a Star Wars game. And I said, no, play a Wars game. I was like, OK, so we will be knights, and we will be guarding the, the hill, and then we're going to charge down on any enemies. It's like, OK, I'll see how that works for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also not just creating multiple education, creates not only critical thinkers, but creative problem solvers. And if you have been given all the answers and given all the media and given all the pictures, you're not going to be very creative because you're just going to go along with whatever somebody else came up with that was an interesting solution to a problem. Because children come out of all education with this ability to see things that do not exist. Because they can see in their imaginations how that problem in the break room can be fixed because they're thinking outside of the box and they do have that ability to imagine and bring that to life because they're always doing everything they don't just say hey Harry maybe we should do that no I don't do it. oh yeah they want to do it because they see it and they want to solve problems so thank you Supplementary question, probably you could say anything. So, uh, there are apps right, like educational that are not most convenient video for fun or game, seems to be bad, even for us <laughs> kids. Like, you know. So, taking advantage of those apps, is that recommended? Like, maybe not pre K, K, but at certain age, seems like, you know, apps also have, maybe they are developing, some people are making. So is there any recommendation from the teacher that you know th these are the good things you can do other if you want to do something, you know, electronic consumption? Or do you still try to focus that there's no media at all at home? Oh, also great question. Uh apps you know, for all of them. Um I would say and I'll open it up um, as well, is that so in a world of education, their days are packed uh, full of, so they arrive, you know, for 8.30 start time in the grades, and they're done in the middle school, doesn't get off till 3.30, and their days are packed with humans teaching them, like all sorts of these amazing subjects from anywhere from, yeah, history, geography, math, physics, chemistry, 
to strings, chorus, handwork, Spanish, Japanese. And so I feel like my first reaction is they don't need any more educational apps in the afternoon. It's like they've gotten such rich education from human beings in front of them that that would be the golden way to leave it and let them like digest all of that. If they're in the older grades, they're going to have homework, projects, things that they're going to bring into their afternoons and then play and eat and sleep and come back for more. Um, so that's my initial reaction to like, they won't really need that supplement. You know, if it's something like, oh, on the weekend, instead of doing this, like maybe this educational app, I mean, again, we're not extreme. It's like, well, come to your house and go, well, let me find all your devices. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the world is the world. And we recognize that. And you go to the cash register, there's a video there. You go to pump your gas, there's a video there. You know, it's, it's everywhere. And we also don't want to be so exclusionary that you're like, bubble them up in a tiny ball and then throw them out into the public high school where everyone's talking about everything. So little bits and pieces, yeah. And I think if that's something that, you know, you would go into and you would talk to your teacher and say, hey, I found this. What do you think of this for the weekend, if, like for half an hour or something like, I don't know, this is, well, I wouldn't do that one. Maybe this one, you know. Um, because little doses, yeah. And like it was funny what you're saying about the articles, because you can always go out and find an article to support whatever you want to, <laughs> right? You can find one that maybe is not good for kids, and then there's one that just came out, something about video gaming and how great it is for your brain. And it's like you can always find it. So, I mean, it would just be kind of a, we're not going to go, nothing ever, you know, we have to be real about it. Is that helpful? I, I don't know. I think a lot of the parents are creators too, and, you know, anyone makes video games. Yeah. Like you said, you're not showing up to our house right now. Uh, <laughs> well, that's nice. <laughs> I just want to add to what you had said. Yeah. How the brain actually works is just like Lisa says. And Rudolf Steiner talked about this, but in his own way. And now we see many things in brain science corroborating what Rudolf Steiner said 100 years ago. So, he talked about Rudolf talked about digestion. And so now we see brain research that's saying you're, you have a part in your brain called the hippocampus, which is like a short term, it is a short term memory. So everything gets loaded into the hippocampus all day long. And now they go to, the children go to sleep. Hopefully they will sleep well and deeply. Because then what's happening is, is the hippocampus is unloading backwards. So, like Lisa said, it's a packed day. They have a lot to digest. And if they don't have enough time to sleep, and they're doing a lot of other digesting, of carrying that from the hippocampus up to the cortex, building all these little synapses and pathways, um, the last stuff is not going to make it out, and it'll have to come back again. So, it's important to know that children, as well as adults, only need so much to digest at night. They only need so much for the brain to do its work to build up these synapses and connections. And so if they have too much, they're not going to have enough time sleeping when they are trying to take that from the short-term memory and create it into long-term. So there's only so much a child can digest in a day. So there's no real need to pack in extra things, maybe on the weekend, but even so you're not, the child's not actually doing anything. They're sitting and they're watching something, they may be pressing buttons, but their body is not doing anything. And so we really put a lot of emphasis on movement because children inhabit a body and they need to be able to know where their body is in space and time. They need to know how to coordinate spinning and jumping and where their joints are and how they can rest easily if they know where their joints are. Well, that comes from movement. You can't get that from an app. You can't get that from any educational thing because that's what's important. And Rose Steiner talked about that. We need to integrate this into actual doing, actual experiences, the smell, the taste, the sounds, the feeling of doing the Wimberley project. So I just leave you with that part. thought. I think part of it comes down to tactility. 
also. Sometimes with apps, it's like you don't have that tactility movement, right? So it's the difference between this and actually taking a pen or a pencil and writing and registering your mind. I think that's that's part of what we found that was kind of missing, you know, educational apps. Because we looked into it too, we were like, oh, you know, there's some really cool stuff out there that has good content, but then it's it's sort of the tactility of it, it's it's missing. Right? And then what we found like the education here is that there is the care taken into actually working with your hands and registering like your actions and it's very intentional, you know. Uh, so that's like I said earlier, you know, I don't get it all the time. <laughs> uh, but when I do and it clicks, I'm like, that's why. Thank you. I can add one more thing that's like a little bit of disrespect obviously as a student, but I personally didn't grow up with any electronics until eighth grade. I can say I rebelled a lot, but looking back, it definitely there's something different about growing up, just like doing the things you wanted to do instead of like I remember for my seventh grade project, instead of typing on the computer, I had to go to the library to get a stack of books like this big to research my physical product project I wanted to do. But going back to apps, I found now now in high school, a lot of other schools we do use the computer lab, we do research on it. And the best way to do your, do your research is not just to use whatever app that's like teaching you thing. I find personally to digest the material and find it the most interesting for myself, I have to do my own research. I have to go looking for these articles. I have to digest these scientific articles, read through them, summarize them for myself. And I've tried, like let's say, I think it was last year, I was like, okay, maybe I should like focus my Spanish a little bit more, so I downloaded the link I guess. Probably all heard of it, right? And I just didn't find it interesting. You click this button, and you, I don't know, there wasn't this satisfying thing like, okay, I found it, I finally understand it. I guess we have, we have two seventh graders that we're looking at bringing here. We came here before when they were little and then we were kind of scared of the whole media things. We were like, ah, like I think that was really, I was wondering, I was trying to remember why, why didn't we do Waldorf? And I think it was because we were totally terrified of like taking all that away. And now we have two seventh graders who have been in the two public schools, really good public schools in Long Beach. And now we have them a charter in Huntington Beach. So our story is similar to yours, but they're older. Um, but now we know like the way you're all talking, they're they're empathetic, they're kind, they're so they're just these amazing children and they are not fitting in like public, it's really hard for them. So now we're back here and it's really interesting because our boys don't want cell phones, like they think they're the devil and they're like they don't want to be on social they don't they think social media is evil. So it's just funny because we didn't even raise them like that, but they're kind of like Waldorf kids naturally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they do, they're creators though. They do like, one of them likes to make, um, he's really into stop motion, but he's very like, he moves it and he's just, he'll spend hours like, but it's, I feel like that sort of thing would be okay here. I don't know, because that's like, it's a creative and we're, they're very artistic. But my question is basically, we're kind of scared because they're seventh graders, and I love that you went to high school because you. What was your name? Yeah, Amelia. Amelia. So Amelia, you went to high school, but you didn't. I go, didn't go to the lower school. Either. Yeah. So I guess we were kind of scared taking them and putting them in at seventh grade. We're like, is it too late? Like, is it too late? Or are they going to be okay? Um, so I guess that's our biggest concern. Really, is th they're so much older coming in here. I think. I mean, I had a great transition, but I also think that as as you get older in Waldorf, at school you're not exposed to technology, but there is still more of an understanding of you need to be taught how to be smart about technology and all this. I mean, they're middle schoolers. It's not going to be like they come here and it's like, we don't know phones. We've never looked at a computer. We still address the modern age of social media and technology and still talked about in a way that is understandable to them in a way that is more critical and more, uh, I don't know, it's, it's just more on their level and more they can, they can really think about it. 
So I think that if your boys are already not interested in social media or technology, then they're not going to have a problem here. Uh, it's not like uh, the middle schoolers, middle schoolers here don't know what it is. I think it's just that I think the ha going into a school at any age can change your perspective on things and give you just this deeper enriching of an education to have both. You have this perspective of public education and of Waldorf. It, it kind of gives you the best of both worlds. You have, you have a little bit of the mainstream and then you have some of the, the Waldorf and you're like, oh, okay. I can now go into high school and adulthood and take what I've learned from both and I can talk to anybody about anything. I can relate to the people who went to public school, I can relate to the people who went to Waldorf school, and that is huge. It, it opens your world exponentially to have that. And I think they would have really interesting perspectives that they could share with the students here as well. There's a lot that they could gain and a lot that the other students could gain from them. But technology-wise, I think, I think it's probably more of a fear for you than it would be for them. I think they fit right in. And yeah, Star Ocean was really cool. Like that's not gonna be something that they're gonna be discouraged from doing. It's you know, it's it's art, it's it's creative, as Lisa was saying, her son is in film, it's you know, it's it's about creating and that is just as creative as painting or as writing. So Yeah. My yeah. son dabbled in Minecraft and he's a mechanical engineer in my father, so um, you know, it's not all extremes. And I wanna say also that your story isn't super rare. Like we and other water schools all the time have students transferring in from public schools. Why? Because they're, you know, it's not the match for them for whatever reason, you know, their area, their school, their kiddo. And especially now after we took education and the pandemic into people's living rooms, right? Parents started to see like that's what their children were receiving and they were like, oh, I think I wanna look for something different. So um, we do have many students here who came from public school at different ages. And what I see when they, um, so overall, or for different schools, maybe other larger privates or, or whatnot, but I think the, the one thing I've seen in transitions is that it takes a little bit of time for some of them, if they've been under a lot of pressure, if they've been under a lot of pressure for time tests and doing it perfectly and getting that A and, and all of that, if they're, if they're if they're living in a little bit of stress about, am I doing it right, am I doing it right, am I doing it right, I want to be great, then it takes them a little bit of time to understand what we're doing here, because they're like, I'm just afraid, and I'm like, well, what? What if my painting isn't right? And I'm like, how can that be true? Like, how can your painting not be right? <laughs> like, it's your painting. And it takes them a little bit of time to realize that we're, nobody's competing against each other here at all. Like. Everyone's looking at them. The teachers look at each child and say, okay, who is the best you you can be? That's what I'm focused on. I'm not, I don't care where you land in the, you know, the hierarchy of the class and percentages or time tests. You know, it's like, who are you? Are you doing your best work? This is what we're focused on. And so because of that, the other students also feel that and they're never like, what'd you get? What'd you, you know, how did you do it? I don't know, maybe parents can speak to that, or Erin, maybe you could speak to that, of how that feels. I know you didn't transition in, but you did have classmates who did. And um, that's the one thing I think sometimes takes a little bit of time for them to get, and get what's going on. I'm like, oh, like, I can relax, and I can do my, my best. Mm -hmm. I'll just share real quickly on that. Uh, our oldest son really hated school. I mean, completely hated school. Uh, so much so that he would cry on Sundays having to go back to school on Monday. And it was it was so much. It was everything he said, Lisa, and also you know, the, the homework regimen that started at kindergarten, just how painful that was for, for him and our whole family. And uh, in all seriousness, he and his younger brother now are so disappointed when it's the weekends. Truly, they're like, ah, I want to go to school. And that's the most special thing, I think, for us is we feel like, okay, we found it, right? Uh, we, we didn't think that there was going to be any success achieved if our kids hated going to school. 
right? We were forcing it, and it just wasn't working for anybody. And so uh, it's just nice to be in a space where they're happy because then we feel like they're absorbing so much, and that's going to certainly translate to better outcomes much later in life. So, but but I'm interested in your perspective uh, from a student. Okay, yeah. So this year we had a girl come from. I don't know if you heard of it, SHL. It's a super academic um, chart. What's the chart going? That's okay. Private school in. I don't know where it is. In somewhere, Orange County. Somewhere, yeah. And first couple of days, like first couple of weeks, she was quiet. But we've been in school now, like almost three months now, and she's definitely, it's like a flower unfolding. She's like, she's kind of let herself like out, and she's like, yeah, she's like really happy, and she's, she, I was talking to her, and yeah, she said like, she wasn't top of the pack, and she was just like in the middle, and she said it was really stressful for her. There was like a lot of pressure to do tests and like do well on these certain academics, but when she came here, she just kind of like, she still does like really well, right? And there's, obviously we have grades in high school, and we have to do all these tests, and like if you don't, then you can have to. You have to go talk to your teacher and stuff, but there wasn't that pressure anymore to like, I have to be in the top of the class, I can just like do well, and I can just be myself. Yeah, just to add on to that, I think that's the biggest difference between, there's a lot of differences, but that's perhaps the biggest difference between what a good public school is and a good Waldorf is that competition. At a good public school, even if you have a truly great experience, and I went to a really good public school as a child, and I really enjoyed it, but one of my, as, as I went through middle school, I, that pressure builds and builds and builds and builds, and even your closest friends are kind of competition. Mm -hmm. And that just was not present at Waldorf. People are all different levels of, you know, skills in different areas, and some people are more academic focused than others, but it wasn't this fight that I feel like it was at the public school. Also, there's oh, I'm sorry, there's a lot of You first. Okay. <laughs> um, the, as, as I think we have, what, 15 in our class right now. But that's really small compared to the public school, right? And we're really close knit, and there's no competition. Like, I remember there was one last year we had a big final test for like a main lesson for Andrew Woods. Human anatomy, and I think seven of us all stay on the table, and all talking to each other. It was like, they all talk to each other. This one student be helped on this question, then we all helped on it. So, to tie in what these two are saying about um, while they're helping each other out, and to follow the seventh grade with your children going here in seventh grade. So, my husband was a Walter fan as well. Um, he did early, early childhood, he left and went to public school all the way to, I guess, either seventh or eighth grade, and he finished high school as a Waldorf man. <clears throat> um, and him and his friends from, from his graduating class, they're all, the boys are all still pretty close to the point where one of, the, one of his friends started a production company in Hollywood. And so he ended up hiring like four of them to join him. And so they stayed close. And to follow up with what you're asking about your son doing stop motion, a lot of them got into production, either making the films or creating every aspect of it. So the create the the creating versus consuming, they totally they totally went that path. So this is the way to go. Our kids have no competitive bones in their body at all. <laughs> they're twins, and they're just like, why would anyone do that? And they're like best friends, and they never fight with each other, and they're just like, why would anyone ever be mean to like another sibling or another anything? And I'm like, well, the, way you guys, the way you guys are is actually more abnormal. Like, you know, like siblings usually get annoyed with each other. <laughs> it's just really, yeah, and they do not like to compete. They, do not, they don't even understand the concept. They're like, why would you? that so it's just been really hard. <laughs> I'm seeing the next event would be your sons doing an event on why you should not be yes. <laughs> 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 um, You know I, I just have to share because this is an interesting parallel. We met uh, two parents on our soccer team this year and one of them is a teacher at Kettering and they have twin sons uh -huh. and uh, they explored Waldorf and they really like it, but because mom's a teacher at the school that they go to, they plan to keep their kids at that school now with the intention to transition into Waldorf in middle school. Uh, 
So it may seem atypical, but her perspective, and I thought it was really smart, you know, she said, if there's any time that I would want my kids to have a Waldorf environment, it would be during middle school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's rough. Uh, it's <laughs> interesting. It's <laughs> tough. Yeah, yeah I would say middle school is the hardest two to three years, depending on where you go, of schooling. It's the most awkward time. It's, they're hitting puberty, they have all these feelings and language and insecurities and stories they tell themselves about what everyone's thinking about them and they're sure of it and they're sure what that look meant and they're sure that they're talking about it. It's a really tough time and I think um, what we see here and what we talk about is when you have a school or any water school, not just ours, where they have preschool all the way up to eighth grade and they're all in the same environment. You know, we have to hold our middle schoolers to that, like, hey, hey, you're not alone here. Like, it's not this one middle school and everyone's going through all of those feelings and <laughs> language issues at the same time and kind of this, you know, I don't know, pool of it, let's just say, versus when you have kind of this littles to the bigs and those middle schoolers are responsible. They have to know how they're presenting themselves and they are the examples for these younger grade students that look up to them like you wouldn't believe. And so, and it's nice we partner them. So like our middle schoolers will do reading or pumpkin carving or some craft with the first grade. Like they were, our seventh and eighth graders were carving pumpkins at the first grade. Super adorable, like helping them. And then like the you know, sixth grades are carving with the second grades. and. So there's a lot of partnership to keep them younger, longer, to kind of keep them, again, not like totally finally bubble wrapped, but to keep them in a, in a space of reverence longer, where to, to give them time to understand who they are in, in an atmosphere where they're not full of peer pressures. Um, because I think one thing that's beautiful, every time we let go of a class, yours included, Aaron, I would look at them and say like, you're going to be great. Like, you all know who you are, and you are confident, in, you know, and here's all my advice like, going forward. But now you know that when you go to high school, you don't, if you're with a group that you don't feel is in line with you, you know to walk away. You don't have to do that. You know who you are, go find your people. Um, you don't, yeah. So, anyway, it's my little soapbox speech about middle <laughs> school because it is really tough out there. And there's a lot of influences pouring in, and we just try and keep that out here for a while longer. Yeah. I just want to add to that. Um, I, we, our kids go here. I have a, a daughter in fifth grade and a son in third grade. And I think what I appreciate too is, I mean, going through puberty and kind of we're kind of starting into that almost on the verge of middle school time. And the teachers really look out for what's going on with your kid, you know? And it's like, hmm, June seems off today, you know, is, is anything going on? And just like knowing that someone is loving them and like watching over them and in communication with you during this time of growth, like what a gift. Yeah. And I feel like that could be lost in a different environment when there's so many people to keep track of, like how could a teacher keep tabs and, um, I really appreciate that, but it's the whole community looking out for the kiddos and helping lift each other up and take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not much gets past us. No, exactly. <laughs> like, like, good. That, like, <laughs> I see every kid go by my door, and, and the teachers are really in tune with it. Um, and it goes from the littles on up. I mean, yeah. from preschool on up, you're right. It's kind of like you get that, and it's like, hmm. And I think part of that is because the teachers follow the children. We don't just have a first grade teacher who stays a first grade teacher. The children starts in first grade, and their teacher will follow them through the grades. So in mainstream, that's called looping, but uh, we were saying we were about that a long time ago. <laughs> because you don't have to reestablish a relationship. You don't have your teacher who already know the child. And it gives you a sense of security in that as you move along, you'll go through these different stages 
with the children. And because Waldorf teachers have to have Waldorf teacher training, three some plus years, and then we also have to keep our education up by going to conferences, extra workshops, extra trainings, that um, we really are immersed in wanting the best for each child. We look at each child and feel like, what does this child need to help balance them? Where is where are their strengths, where are their challenges, and how can I help to provide that for this child and that child and that child and that child? So it really has this sense of being a father of your children. Not in the kingdom for everybody I never get to be. <laughs> it takes a special person to do early childhood. But I think that has a lot to do with how everyone feels more comfortable and the teacher doesn't have to relearn the child. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has something in regards to the topic of competition or lack of competition between the kids. Um, I have twin daughters in the fourth grade class here, and they, unlike your sons, fight all the time. <laughs> um, but one of my favorite things about the students what, what I've observed about the students is that they say the cutest things about their classmates with regard to, like, oh, you should have seen how well so-and-so did this, or, you know, they, they don't have this, I don't think they have the same sense of, like, being um, you know, ranked, where mm -hmm. all of their work that they do in the school boils down to, like, this one number, their one rank. So they understand that they might be really strong in some subjects and maybe not so strong in other subjects. And likewise, some of their classmates might not be as strong in the subject they're very strong in, but they recognize that they have strengths in other places. And um, they're, you hear it often, uh, where kids will talk very highly about their classmates' abilities. And then touching on with something you were saying, Said about keeping, allowing even the middle schoolers to live in their like, youth, stay younger. This comes out in very simple ways. So like two weeks ago, I was looking at my new rain boots for one of my daughters, and the other one was the old, the other, the six minute older daughters. <laughs> <laughs> so much bigger. <laughs> um, and as we were looking for boots, she's just outgrowing the youth sizes. <laughs> and the Next kind of group of sizes were all like these combat boot style. Like there was a lot of that. Oh, this is fair. And, um, but we did find a few of like the tall boots in kid sizes. And she was contemplating and contemplating. And she said, "You know, Mom, I really like puddles. I really like to get into puddles that go to about here. So I'm gonna get the tall boots." <laughs> and I just said, "Yay! You know, the puddles <laughs> And she's not in an environment where I'm sure she was thinking. Is it okay for me to be in these puddles yeah. and be seen in these puddles, right? And I think she recognizes, they recognize that they're in an environment where it's okay to be themselves. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> so I noticed the email you put the time it's like 7.44, and I know on our agenda we might be having this break around not just for mingling, maybe there's some questions you didn't want to ask in front of the group to us, but I wondered if we could wrap by just having our panel be able to kind of Maybe share some, like, one or two things that stands out for you on, um, on Waldorf education. Or maybe you have it. I don't know. Heavy at the lot. No pressure. Like, talk about it. Like, if any of you want to share, just kind of anything that you didn't get to say tonight that you'd like to share with somebody who's wondering if this is going to be like, what is it all about? Right? What I really love is when Rudolf Steiner says, this is an education to uh, grow a human being. Mm -hmm. And so we as teachers and parents, we're all here to help our children grow into a full functioning, feeling, um, empathetic, care, they have care for one another. And this is what is so important, is to help children really see what it is like to grow up to be a really good human being. And I just think that's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. 
no matter what, you know, like my kids are so different, but they're both really wonderful human beings. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I'll share because it hasn't been mentioned tonight. One of the things that I think is really beautiful about Waldorf education, in particular this school, is the parent community. I think it's something that's, that's so easily forgotten, but it's so important to, to raising wonderful human beings, is having these other parents who also care about your child as much as you do and uh, are willing to, to help and support and just be there. You know, it's, it's really hard to do that in many other schools, but it feels like here it's just right. And uh, we've had a lot of experience with schools, and this, this is certainly the, the tightest and best part of the experience. Very true. We hear that, and we see it on the sidewalk the warmth and the care. And when people are sick, there's food at their doors. And when people need a ride, somebody's picking up someone else's kid. And it's all, they're all communicating. They all meet up outside of school. Like, let's go to the park. Let's go camping. I thought you're not sick of each other. Yet. <laughs> Anyone else? So I got a volunteer for a uh, third grade uh, camping. <laughs> 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 and, uh, I've never been camping, so uh, it was at the Highland Hall uh, at the Garden Bridge Waldorf, and uh, it was just kind of interesting because, well, as soon as I came, I got on campus. I don't like the volunteers. <laughs> so I'm like, walking into the class, and I tell the teacher, I'm like, there's this like underlying like film of noise that doesn't just invade your ear and it doesn't go away just by <laughs> being here. Like there's always something going on. Mm -hmm. And after a while like I used to, I'm like, wow, this is so, you know, this is great. So we, we got to the campus and um, so they're building a soka, which is, uh, you know, a religious, you know, you go somewhere on a um, religious expedition, you, you know, you're in the village wilderness, you literally build where you're going to stay. So there's all these uh, plywood and wood on the floor with twine look at it and I'm 42 I'm looking at it like how are, this, how are we gonna make this into a structure but these kids were not intimidated and we you know we nailed them together and they tied it with twine these are third graders and I thought that was just mind-blowing and at night we had campfire stories and singing I was like what was this when I was growing up <laughs> it was just amazing being around the kids that went to the bathroom every 15 minutes <laughs> Nobody, none of these chaperones slept. <laughs> it was a great experience, like watching the kids, uh, third graders from Maple Village, and third graders from Highland Hall, pen pals for maybe a month or two, integrating, like they've been best friends forever. Um, like a few things I saw was uh, this one kid was just off by himself in a tree, this boy. And I said, dude, uh, what, are you, what are you doing up there? Are you okay? I just checked on him. He was like, I'm just uh, finger knitting. <laughs> I think his, uh, his finger knitting was probably from Elisa to, uh, to for Miss Kathy. <laughs> and he was just totally comfortable in, in doing anything. And um, one of the kids asked my daughter how to do one finger knitting. And two. I don't know, it was just amazing watching them just be with each other for the first time and make food together and different things. So I'm just really amazed by the education. And I was very skeptical at first. I'll be honest, Lisa. Sorry, I remember meeting you at this uh, event. <laughs> I had many questions, but uh, six years later, I'm on a panel. <laughs> be careful! Uh, this is where you think <laughs> you could be here next. <laughs> Whatever issues you have, I feel like one of the things I had questions about was reading. I feel like. Um, you know, they should be able to read from the beginning. But then I remember reading as a child, I read lots of things and I did not comprehend them. So it doesn't make any sense that we force our kids to do certain things. And so if you really are concerned with media or reading different things, that Waldorf kind of delays because the kid's mind is not ready to accept that bombardment of information, you can always teach them at home. I remember asking Lisa, I want my kids to be able to read at a certain point. And she said, yeah, it's not. We're not going to police anything. So if you're concerned about anything, you can always supplement at home if you wanted to. Right? Yeah. Right. Makes, makes sense. So. I won't visit their home. <laughs> <laughs> I can also build on that. Like, I think one, okay, so for some reason I hated reading. I didn't read until like fourth grade for some reason. Like, I could read, but like I never wanted to read. I read like the simplest book possible on the shelf when we had to read. <laughs> and it was like that. And then fourth grade came and I loved to read. Um, I read like 12 multiple nights. I got in trouble for. 
<laughs> but there is another, I just want to come through, but for media, I didn't get my phone until summer of 8th grade, so when I was going into 9th grade. I never opened Instagram, I never had a, a TikTok account, none of that. But as soon as I opened, I just had this intuition of like what to do. There's no like really flaw behind that stuff. Like you have this intuition and just like idea of what's supposed to be done and you just kind of do it. And you don't have this fear of like, oh, this is something you gotta know what to do. You just kind of like go into it and learn. Okay. Yeah, I think you mentioned you were concerned for yourself. And I watch a lot of football and basketball. And I feel like because I do less of it, I actually get to engage with my daughters. It's kind of interesting. Okay. A lot of the things that were, I used to do a lot of that fall by the wayside just organically. So when you're present, you're present with them in the moment. And the moment goes by fast. Next thing you know, you're, it's crazy to me. It felt like I was thinking about having kids and now they're eight and six. It's just my <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It keeps going faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, learning to trust in the, the methodology. You know, it was like, for me, it was a process. Uh, and being here five years now, so I'm a, I'm a board trustee member now. So serving, like, you know, the community as a whole. So, and it's been super fulfilling. It just, you know, you can also learn and grow with the process here, the methodology here. Um, yeah, and, and, and I am amazed by comprehension. Like of the kiddos, like um, I bought a book for myself, and it was really about uh, one of Nintendo's famous CEOs uh, called Iwata Sotari. And <clears throat> I was testing the waters on this, and I started reading it to Nathaniel <laughs> like, because it's, a lot of it was, you know, really about you know the human perspective. And he, he kept, he, he wanted me to keep reading it. So I was like, and he got into it. I'm like, should I be reading this? <laughs> but it talked about, you know, really uh, more of the, the human condition than anything else, nothing business, but it was about how to communicate with people, you know, uh, and listen to them. And so he was just really, so I, yeah, I was surprised. Like, I thought he'd be like, Dad, this is boring. <laughs> yeah, but he was like, he was into it. So, yeah, it was interesting. Um, I mean, it's really simple, but I, I think that, as a student perspective, you might, if you're going into Waldorf and you haven't beforehand, you might be a little afraid of a small class size. But I really enjoyed the small class size. I think. Also looking back, there is a lot of, I mean, it's, it forces you to make good relationships. Because at a bigger school, if you fall out with somebody, just don't hang out with them. At a school like this, if you fall out with somebody, you better make nice. Mm -hmm. Because you will see them every day, forever. <laughs> yeah. you, your moms are best friends, and <laughs> everybody goes to the same doctor, so you better talk. Um, and I think that really taught me how to have better interpersonal relationships just with people that I don't necessarily want to be best friends with. I learned how to be good and just amicable with. And I think that that was just hugely influenced by the fact that I was in a small class. It makes you find things that you like about people that you would never have approached in a setting where there's lots of other students. You think, you see somebody and you're like, oh, we just want to be friends. And you just walk away at the school. But a smaller school like this, every single person has something about them that you can connect with. And you actually get a chance to learn that. And that really influenced me as an adult and my ability to talk with anybody and just have relationships. Thank you, Ms. Kathy. I know you have a list driver. I can get you. It's not just like, uh, I'm out. Yeah, I'm just out. <laughs> I had nothing more to say. You can't miss this. It's the long ride. You don't want to miss the list driver. Thank you, Ms. Kathy. Thank you. Anything else? I don't know. I've heard a lot, but I think one thing that I was thinking of from a 
past panel when Kathy was talking about raising a human being is I love this and I never forgot it. There was a, a Waldorf alum who was talking about going out into the world and then meeting all these people in the workplace and she's like, well, I was just so used to being around such round people because we, you know, we have some, we, we teach kinesthetically, visually, auditorially, we teach about maths and sciences, but also language arts and music and chorus and woodworking and handworking. And she's like, I just went out in the world and I met so many pointy people. <laughs> and she's like, I was just used to all these round people. And they were so pointy. And like, I only wanted to know that, you know, and I thought, oh, that was such a great description of what Waldorf education is. I mean, because, you know, as Amelia's saying, you know, you have to work through relationships. You, there's nowhere to go. We also have all these classes in all the arts and all the sciences and all the languages and history. And so just because you don't want to maybe, you know, play that violin, well, you, then you have a choice of a wind. But that's it. <laughs> if you're still going to the orchestra, like, you don't get to sit out. So you're going to try it. I'm not asking you to love everything. But you're going to come out with an experience of trying it. Because you never know. Right? So that's the thing that I was remembering. I think that's like something I love about it. Is and, and I've met my friends who they still don't really understand. What do you, I still don't really get what you can start at the school and then I don't really know so much about it. And then people, oh my gosh, I was on this plane and I met these two young people and they were so eloquent and they knew so much about it and they were so well spoken and so easy to talk to. And I asked them what kind of school they went to and they said, Waldorf school. Now I understand <laughs> what you're talking about, you know. So it is that human human being aspect. So um, I'll, I'll close on that note, just to allow you some time if you wanted to talk to anyone for a few more minutes, but to also honor everyone's time and get to get home to their families um, for just a few minutes and get you some more refreshments and ask Carrie any questions or ask me any questions. I'm happy to. You can call me. I'm happy to talk to you on the phone. Have a meeting. I love working with all little ones up to adults. So, um, so we'll close. Thank you so much to all of you tonight for spending your time with us. Um, and good luck, and we don't ask you to be on the panel. So <laughs>